today we're kind of covering two cookbooks this time as opposed to just one. Because the two cookbooks I'm going to be covering, Mexican Every Day by Rick Bayless, and Molto Italiano, 327 Simple Italian Recipes to Cook at Home, by Mario Batali, both have slightly different things to discuss about them and different flaws, which are worth getting into because part of the reason why I'm doing these cookbook reviews isn't just, oh, I cook and I want to discuss cookbooks. Particularly since these are cookbooks by celebrity chefs who have numerous awards and high rankings from various organizations for their books and their programs and their restaurants and that sort of thing. I'm bringing this up because I want to have some conversation about what makes a cookbook good and what you sh you as a viewer should look for in a cookbook. In particular, by discussing, in my view, what these cookbooks do wrong for the mass market general person, general purpose cook, someone who's trying to learn a new cuisine. This is particularly kind of egregious with Molto Italiano. So, two cookbooks here. Mexican Every Day focuses on Mexican food. Rick Bayless is a celebrity chef who has a program on PBS who focuses on Mexican cuisine, focusing more on dishes which are beyond the standard of what you consider necessary Mexican food in terms of if you were to go to a Mexican restaurant in the United States, like a straight-up sit-down Mexican restaurant. Stuff that's sometimes outside of what you'd find on those, well, on their menu. Something outside of what would probably be close to Tex-Mex or southwestern U.S. cuisine. And Mario Batali, he's Italian-American, and he has even an Italian household, and he's, his focus and his notoriety and his fame is, comes from cooking Italian dishes. It's one of the reasons why, for the television series Iron Chef, he is has been in the past Iron Chef Italy. So, with that said... Well, what makes these cookbooks work and what makes them not? For Mixing Every Day, the recipes in, the, in there are fairly straightforward, and I don't see a significant ingredient availability problem. These are two of the things that come to cookbooks, which I can find concern with this. Can you find the cook, can you find the ingredients, or does it require things that are harder to get a hold of? And if it does require ingredients that are harder to get a hold of, does it call attention to those points? And if possible, does it give substitutions for of some sort or another for that ingredient? And you can't substitute it. Does it explain why? Mexican Every Day, one of the advantages of the fact that almost every state has a significant Hispanic population, is that Hispanic ingredients, or ingredients for Hispanic cooking, are not hard to find. You can go into pretty much any grocery market anywhere and get tortillas. You can get a variety of chili peppers. You uh, you can get even some more, I'll say niche, ingre niche ingredients, niche ingredients is the right word, but more specific ingredients like masa, like uh, the uh, tamale wrapper corn husks. You can get all the, those ingredients without having to necessarily go to a specialty market. You can certainly go to a specialty market and find a better deal on these things, but you can get these ingredients without too much issue. The issue that probably comes up with Mexican every day, there's two ones. First, this is a cosmetic thing, as me as a technical writer, the background of technical writing, is the presentation of the recipes is not very good. Many of the recipes do not necessarily have photographs of the recipe, it's of the, the dish itself in there, nor are there necessarily instructional photographs for if particular techniques are brought up. Like, for example, if you're someone who's never seeded a hot pepper before, having a photograph of, here, of photographs or short series of photographs or drawings or whatever of how you seed a hot pepper and techniques you can use to avoid getting too much capsaicin on your hands, and advice like, for example, having gloves. All those things, not really covered in the book very much. Or, and, so that's an issue. In fact, in some cases, photographs are reused. We'll see a photograph of, for example, 
chopped jalapeno peppers appear next to a major recipe at one point that's probably like, in terms of not so much a major recipe in terms of recipe is super important. All the recipes are weighted equally, but in terms of next to a recipe in the level of weight that you would put a photograph of the dish itself when it's clearly not a photograph of the dish and then the photograph is used somewhere else in the book to illustrate some notes about an ingredient or preparation of an ingredient as an example. The other issue that I have is it doesn't really give a heat index. As someone who had eaten Thai food or had gone to restaurants where you can select the level of heat of your dish and that sort of thing, I mean, I'm kind of spoiled for having an idea of, okay, I can get some information beforehand of how hot a dish is theoretically going to be. Not just, is this dish going to be hot, spicy or not, but spicy comes on a gradient. Spicy is a spectrum. And this is ever more of a case with hot peppers. Because bell pepper is completely mild. You have, on the other hand, you at the far edge, you have your Carolina Reapers and your ghost peppers and that sort of thing. And I cook for people who do not necessarily have a strong tolerance for spice. I'm good with spicy, but not everyone I cook for is. And so when I'm choosing recipes for the cookbook for trying out before doing reviews, one of the things that came up was, okay, how do I judge what ingredients in here are spicy? The easy shorthand is what type of pepper is used in a dish. You, if a recipe is using a habanero pepper, it's probably going to burn your mouth off. Not going to be like Carolina Reaper spicy, not weaponized capsaicin spicy, but like, this is going to have a significant burn, you're going to be sweating, you're going to have to blow your nose, you're going to have to have a beer or something with this to kind of help damp down the spice. So, there's that on one side of the coin. On the other hand, the catch is finding the other end, the milder end. Because I re all the dishes in here in some form or another involve some sort of chili pepper, which is fine. But there are, and there's, not all chilies are created equal, and some peppers, like the Anaheim, aren't necessarily that hot. You would think. I cooked with, before I started going on this project and going through this cookbook, I cooked with Anaheims before. Now when I cook with them, I chopped them up, I chopped the end off, I deseeded them, I'd taken care of the, for lack of a better term, the spine isn't quite the right term, there's a technical term for it, but it's, it's the there's a bit of tissue, um, plant matter on the inside of the pepper that I also have the ridges, to be the short term. There's an actual technical term, I've spaced it, someone will probably post it in the comments. Be polite when you do. So, I cooked with Anaheim's before, and I thought, oh, there's a mild, they're a little more flavorful than a bell pepper, but they're not like jalapeno. They're a nice little middle ground, which if I want something cooking for someone with a low spice tolerance, but I want to have a little zing to it, ah, that's a good way to go. The recipe called for roast Anaheims. I never roasted Anaheims before. And so thus, I didn't know that when you roast an Anaheim, it gets spicier. Like, to put it, mild, to put it on the mild, medium, hot spectrum that you get for a salsa, that you see on salsa jars. A straight-up Anaheim, chopped up, used in a dish, in that fashion, is a mild. You roast it, keeping in mind that you cannot remove the ribs and the seed pod and the seeds before you roast it, and that is where a lot of the capsaicin is. Roasting it brings the Anaheim up to a medium. And I did not know that. I have no problem with medium spicy whatsoever. I like medium spicy. That's my preferred level of spiciness if I'm just going to eat a dish and I'm not going out for super heat. I just want to describe it as my lunch level spicy as opposed to a dinner level spicy. The people who the people I was cooking for at this time 
were more of a mild level, which is why I selected this dish in the first place, because it didn't have anything, any pepper which, by my perception, was hotter than an Anaheim. So that was a surprise. And for some of the people I was cooking for, it was a unpleasant surprise. And there wasn't anything in the book to note this. And if you're cooking Mexican food for the first time, if you're someone who's going, okay, I enjoy eating Mexican food, I want to make this at home, I know, I recognize Rick Bayless's name from PBS, so I pick up this cookbook because that, because it feels like this book is a good introduction for Mexican food, which otherwise it is. Not having any guidance on the level of spicy in a dish is a deal breaker. That is a big freaking deal when it comes to recipe writing, and when it comes to planning together a menu, which is an important part of cooking and being a home cook, is putting together your menu of what you're cooking when, doing your grocery shopping to get all the ingredients you need, and all this sorts of stuff. So that in and of itself is a significant disappointment and makes it harder for me to recommend Mexican Every Day as a cook. Next up, quickly talk about Mario Batali, because I've thought about this and considered doing the review of Batali's book separately, but... My points of discussion here are a little more minor. I mean, they're, they're significant, but they're also shorter to talk about. Molto Italiano, that says right there in the title, Simple Italian Recipes. This is meant to be a beginner's guide to Italian cooking. Lots of people love Italian food. Italian food is excellent, it is wonderful. If you're going to do a cookbook for beginners in Italian food to get them, ease them in there, in a way that they wouldn't necessarily be used to otherwise, I'm all for it. Molto Italiano, when it comes to ingredient selection, focuses a lot, I mean, to be fair, Batali's specialty is Italian cooking. He's been to Italy, he's studied in Italy. So he understands the combination of ingredients to make dishes and why certain ingredients are necessary. The problem being is there are some ingredients available in Italy which are harder to get a hold of in parts of the United States that aren't the East Coast. I bring this up in comparison with Mexican Everyday because of Mexican Everyday. Everywhere in the U.S. has a significant Hispanic population. At hell, if you're in Canada, there's probably a significant enough Hispanic population that's probably not too hard to find chili peppers. If you're in the U.K., it's a different deal. But if you're in North America, you can find the ingredients needed to prepare Hispanic dishes, Mexican dishes, at home without having to go too far out of your way, without having to go to a expensive gourmet grocery store, basically. You're going to some place where you have to spend a bunch extra, like, oh, cost, not, not cost plus world market to go to, no, the cost plus world market isn't groceries, to go to a, a Trader Joe's, to go to a um, Whole Foods to get a particular type of fish. With Molto Italiano, a lot of the ingredients in here require a certain degree of stuff that is harder to get a hold of. For example, monkfish. I was looking to prepare a seafood dish on the cookbook. And I was looking for, okay, my family members who have shellfish allergies. So shellfish is out problem being shellfish is the most easy to get a hold of of the various seafood ingredients in the book. Shrimp, very easy to find. Lobster, expensive, you can find. Crab, expensive, you can find. Shrimp is probably the cheapest one to get a hold of because shrimp is, for, is much easier to farm raise. I'm like, okay, I need to cook fish. I want to cook fish dish. And I'm relative with a shellfish allergy and has problems with redfish, particularly salmon. So, redfish out, shellfish out, this leaves whitefish. What whitefish dishes do we have? We have dishes with monkfish. I can't get monkfish near me, and I'm on the west coast of the United States. I'm more in the Pacific Northwest area. I suspect this would be an issue in California as well. So, what do I replace monkfish with? Do I use cod? With? Do I use cod? Do I use tilapia? What do I use as a replacement for monkfish? If you can't get monkfish because someone near you sells it, due to geog geographical reasons, or because you can't afford it. And the answer in the cookbook is not given. I had to go online. 
that's not good writing. If an ingredient is not necessarily available, if you can't, within reason, assume whether that ingredient is available, it is important to have some notes on substitutions. This is something that... This is something that Mark Bittman covers in his cookbooks. Is Bittman, if there's an, if he puts ingredients for his recipes that are generally easy to get a hold of. If something is a bit more difficult to get a hold of, he puts notes on where you can find it and to a certain degree what can you substitute it for, substitute with it. If you can't get a hold of Marin, Marin, I don't know, I'm making the pronunciation, Japanese cooking wine, okay, you can use a sherry, you can just get, get sherry, or you can use white wine, a dry white wine. They're not, when it comes to flavor context, when it comes to how it behaves when cooked with, each will be slightly different, but give substitution information. And because of that, you can go, okay, I can work from this, and I can prepare this recipe. It won't be exactly the way it is, that it is as written, but I have picked up skills which I can use to prepare other dishes later, not just in terms of technique, but in terms of knowledge of Marin can be substituted for Sherry, or Sherry can be substituted for Marin, or White Wine can be substituted for all of the above in a pinch, which is good. That is a useful skill. Now, that is something to have in your notepad, to have in your Google Keep, to have in your cookbook stuck on an index card somewhere, as a heads up, as something that you know, okay, I can do this substitution if an ingredient is not available. And if you're teaching someone to, to cook a style of cuisine, a to cook Italian cuisine, French cuisine, German, Eastern European, Spanish, Mexican, whatever, having these substitutions in your arsenal, arsenal, knowing these substitutions so that you can still prepare these dishes if ingredients are not available or if your budget is tight is valuable and particularly because if you if you're trying to expand your culinary arsenal because you're trying to eat healthier because you're trying to have a brighter variety of brighter variety of cooking options because you're trying to teach yourself to cook and you're trying to teach yourself to cook the things that you like to eat and that you would normally be going out to eat but you don't want to do that anymore because you're trying to save money or trying to lose weight or what have you having these substitutions in your arsenal is important and Molto Italiano is a cookbook that's trying to teach you a cuisine. It says itself right there in the title, Easy Recipes. And admittedly, from a craft standpoint, from a technique standpoint, these recipes are straightforward to pull off, more or less. Some things are a little trickier than others, like in terms of if you've never wrapped a fish in parchment before and cooked it that way, that can be a daunting prospect. Or, for that matter, cooking a fish that is intact, as opposed to a fillet, can be a daunting prospect, because there'd be bones in that fish, and you know there are bones in that fish, and they can lead to a degree of intimidation. But, if you're cooking, but if you want to learn to cook, if you're teaching people to cook a type of cuisine that they've never cooked before, having that instructional information is a big, fat, hairy deal. And not including that, I, as a person with a background in technical writing who likes to cook, that is a problem to me. So, there is my culinary doubleheader. Next time, we'll have our next episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives. See you then. Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, if you want to go see what I reviewed previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down, while well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you a mention in the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, 
you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everybody. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.